one receiver on the, the side left here, and a whole couple of centers on the right hand side that have the public key corresponding to the secret key of the receiver. And all the senders are interested in picking messages and sending them to the receiver. And they want to do that by means of public key encryption. So what does it mean? They all pick fresh randomness, encrypt the message, and send it via some public channel to the, uh, to the receiver. OK, so far so good. So what do we assume? Well, we assume that there's an adversary that observes everything that is sent on the channel, meaning he sees all the ciphertexts. Plus, we assume that the adversary is capable of corrupting some of the senders. What does corrupting mean? Well, corrupting means the adversary will learn the message sent by these senders that he corrupted, plus the randomness used to encrypt. And the randomness obtained by the adversary essentially allows the adversary to recompute and check that the message he just learned is actually contained in the ciphertext he already observed. OK, and the question is, well, what about the security or confidentiality of messages that were sent by non-corrupted parties? So for instance, in our case, what about the confidentiality of message M2? OK, so why is it interesting? Well, it dates back to a paper published almost 20 years ago. And back there, it was considered for commitment schemes and called the selective decommitment problem. Um, and there's still lots of open questions going on. What makes it interesting is, furthermore, that the messages might depend on another. So what does it mean? Assume message M2. Assume message M2 depends on message M1. And if some adversary obtains the information message M1, he might already obtain some, obtain some information on message M2. So we should rephrase, do messages of uncorrupted parties remain confidential to do they remain as confidential as they can? OK, for quite a long while, we didn't know how standard security, meaning CPI or CCA, relates to selective opening security. And only recently, Hoffmann and Al could show that selective opening security, whether you go for passive or active attacks, is actually strictly stronger than the standard counterpart of it. OK, so let's turn the scenario we are facing into a proper security definition. And we're going to do that by means of the real ideal paradigm. And we're going to start with the real setting. So on the left-hand side, there will be the real game. On the right-hand side, the adversary. OK, so what is going to happen? The real game will generate a public key to secret key. We'll give the public key to the adversary. And we are interested in active attacks, meaning the adversary will have access to a decryption oracle with the usual restrictions. OK, what's going to happen now? We allow the adversary to control the message distribution the senders will sample their messages from. OK, so the adversary picks, picks the message distribution, sends it to the real game, and the real game will sample n messages accordingly. Now the real game will encrypt the messages and send them back to the adversary. And now we're going to model the corruption phase. And for historical reasons, we're going to call the corruption phase opening phase. So the adversary is allowed to make an open request, and the game reveals message mi and randomness ri of sender i. OK, and the adversary can do this multiple times. And eventually, the adversary outputs something that we just call out. And the real game just returns out too. And intuitively, think of out as some information the adversary tried to derive on non-opened ciphertexts. OK, and for the ideal game, we're just going to move every artifact from public key encryption. So we end up in such a game. So there's no key generation. There's no public key send. There's no encryption happening, uh, no access to the decryption oracle. And the simulator, which we call the adversary in the, so the adversary in the, real, in the ideal game, we just relabel to a simulator, um, is allowed to make open queries, but will only receive the message. OK, and when do we call some public encryption scheme secure? Well, we call it simulation-based selective opening CCA secure. If you're every efficient adversary, there is an efficient simulator that can essentially derive the same information. What does it mean? Uh, the ciphertexts that weren't open didn't leak any information. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a simulator being able to derive the same information as A. OK. Um, what I would like to do now is show you how public encryption is ideally done in practice, or how to obtain efficient public key encryption. 
And this you usually do by the chem dem approach, meaning you want to use an asymmetric primitive to establish a symmetry key. And then you use some highly efficient mode of operation like counter mods, CBC, CCM, GCM to encapsulate your data you actually want to protect. And this is what you would like to do to obtain efficient public key encryption. And we already have some results on the selective opening security of practical public key encryption. Well, or maybe not. So there's one paper by Hoya et al. that took a look at the hashed algamal and OAP, and they could show that uh, both transformations or schemes are selective opening secure, under the same notion we just saw. However, to obtain the result, they had to instantiate, in the case of DHIES, for OAP it's already done by default, they had to instantiate the DEM to be the one-time pad which severely restricts the practicality of these schemes because, well, you're limited to uh, a message length that corresponds to the output length of the hash function. Okay. Now I'd like to come back and show you how you could approach a proof for uh, simulation by selective opening security. So, remember that for every A, we have to show that there exists a simulator that can derive essentially the same information. So what we're going to do is we're going to take an adversary that runs in the real game and we will construct a simulator that will internally, internally run A and can ideally derive the same information as A just by outputting it. And this has been done like that before and we follow this approach. Okay, so let's have a closer look at the interaction that will happen on the right-hand side. Okay, so the simulator will do something and at some point, the adversary will output a message distribution which will just relay to the ideal game. Then the ideal game will do nothing because it's the ideal game and not the real game. However, the simulator has to output ciphertext to the adversary. Then the adversary will post open queries, which we can still forward. The ideal game will answer with a message, and the simulator is supposed to answer with a message and the random is used to encrypt the message. And this will happen multiple times, and eventually the adversary will output something, and we just want to forward it. And, well, at this point here, over here, the simulator has to somehow come up with ciphertext. And for now, we're just going to call it fake CI. So the simulator has to find a way to come up with ciphertext. And when he eventually learns the message in this step, and wants to reveal it to the adversary, he has to find a way to make sure that the encryption he already committed to becomes an actual encryption of the message he just obtained and wants to forward to the adversary. Okay, we just call the second step make. Okay, now I would like to show you what a practical data encapsulation mechanism looks like. And we're just going to take a look at the CBC mode plus a Mac. So your message is passed into blocks, passes through the block cipher, and the output is XORed onto the next message entering the block cipher again. And to obtain integrity, we are going to add a MAC. And I want to point out that throughout this talk, K will denote the block cipher key, and K prime will donate some additional key material that will be used by, for instance, a MAC. And if you just have a look at this picture, somehow the cipher texts seem to be separated from the messages by the block cipher. And this seems to be inherent to the construction of this data encapsulation mechanism. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to abstract away the concrete block cipher and just study the, stru study the structure of the data encapsulation mechanism. And this is why we went for the ideal cipher model. So still, the ideal cipher will be keyed by some key K. And we are interested in the structure of the DEM, ignoring the block cipher that is used within the DEM. And this leads to the following definition that will help us to do a proof of selective opening security in the simulation definition. And so this is a, a DEM, as I call it. It's not actually the DEM. In the paper, we call it Oracle DEM. But for simplicity, think of it as a DEM. But we abstract away the block cipher used within the DEM and add it back as Oracle access to the block cipher. So it turns out to be some, some encapsulation mechanism that has Oracle access to the block cipher. 
gets as input the additional key material and the message and outputs the ciphertext. And we're going to say that such a dem is simulatable if we have additional stateful algorithms fake and make, where fake just obtain, obtains the additional key material but not the message and is supposed to output a ciphertext. And later on, we have some algorithm make that can get information from fake because they're stateful and gets its input a message and is supposed to output a permutation. Okay, and we want to have the following properties, namely, if we run, run fake on some key k prime, we obtain a ciphertext, and then we run, run make and obtain some permutation pi tilde, then we want that C is somewhat consistent, and by somewhat consistent I mean if you run the, de the dem encryption with access to pi tilde on M, we obtain C. Plus, we want that if we run that, we obtain a uniform permutation as output by make. Why is it supposed to be uniform? Because we want to patch it into the ideal cipher at some point. Okay. So what can you do with the simulatable dem? Well, let's build our way towards it. So at the top, there will be security notions for chem, below for a dem, and at the bottom for some public key encryption. So what is going to happen? Um, we all know that if we take some CCS secure cam and combine it with a one-time CCS secure dam, we obtain a CCS secure public key encryption scheme. And as we know by result by Bellara et al, we can break down one-time CCS security of the dam to CPS security plus one-time integrity protection of the, well, one-time integrity of the self text, meaning we got one-time integrity guarantees for the dev. Okay, and if you think what simulatability does intuitively, it allows you to come up with ciphertexts that are completely independent of a message. And what you can actually show is that simulatability implies CPA security. Okay, so what does it give us? Well, if we stick to a CCA secure cam, if we add one-time integrity of the ciphertexts additionally to the dam, we should still obtain a CCA secure public key encryption. This is all known, but what we could show is that under these given assumptions, we can prove simulation based selective opening CCA security. So somewhat simulatability allows us to go from CCA security to simulation based selective opening CCA security. Okay, this is one of our contributions for the paper. The second one would be that we study concrete data encapsulations mechanisms, namely the ones standardized by NIST. And what we obtain is like, take any CCA secure cam, combine it with any of these modes of operation. You get a simulation by selective opening CCA secure public key encryption in the ideal cipher model. Um, you have to be careful when picking the dam because some of them need to be equipped with a one-time MAC or something like that to obtain the uh, integrity, the one-time integrity protection you would like to have. Okay, so how do you prove such a statement? Okay, so let's get back to our picture where the simulator has to take care of the interaction between the ideal game and the adversary run inside the simulator. And what I removed by the three dots is something like generation of public key and secret key of the key encapsulation mechanism plus running the key encapsulation mechanism to obtain uh, the symmetric key and encapsulation. Okay, the adversary will output a message. Distribution, we'll just forward it. And now we can run our fake algorithm on the additional key information to obtain fake ciphertexts that we can feed to the adversary. Then the adversary will make open queries. We can just forward them. And the ideal game will reveal message MI to the simulator. Okay, but what can we do now? Well, we can use make to output a permutation. And this permutation will be consistent such that if I run enc with access to pi i on message MI, I will obtain the ciphertext CI as output by fake earlier. Okay, and then I just take the permutation output by make and will patch it into the ideal cipher and then I should be fine. I think this can happen multiple times. And the randomness that is revealed here would be the randomness used by the key encapsulation mechanism. 
And eventually, the adversary will output out, and I'm just going to forward that. Make sense? Yes, so actually this is, yes, this is cheating. So make is actually not, so, so would be sufficient for make to not output a full permutation, but just the, the spots in the permutation relevant for uh, making sure that M is an encryption, uh, sorry, is the message contained in, in some ciphertext C. So what will actually happen is that make will output something we call a partial permutation, and um, the environment outside of make, which will be the simulator in our case, will put this partial permutation into the ideal cipher and will fill up the ideal cipher on the fly by lazy sampling. So yes, make is supposed to output a partial permutation only. Correct. Okay, I'm going to skip over. Uh, sorry. So, I guess intuitively it makes sense because make and fake are designed such that it's supposed to work. The only thing I glossed over is that we want to patch the permutation into the ideal cipher. And it's actually not clear if we can do that because the adversary, so what do we have to do? We have to make sure that to patch pi into the ideal cipher, the ideal cipher has to be sufficiently free. And what I mean by sufficiently free is that it would suffice for the ideal cipher to be free at the spots where we would like to embed the partial permutation. However, it's easy to argue that the whole permutation ICK will be empty. And why is that? Well, at some point we should use the security guarantees of the CAM and the DEM. And this is exactly where they come into play. And just to give you some more detail on that, um, so an ideal cipher is a, is a keyed random permutation, where for each key you get a random permutation. And I'm going to denote a key encapsulation of the block cipher key and the additional key material just by k k prime in a box. So think of this as a CCA secure box. Okay, and if we use this notion, a hybrid encryption of M will contain in the first component uh, the chem part that contains the block cipher key and the additional key material plus the data encapsulation that has Oracle access to ideal cipher K and key material K prime and the message. Okay, and we want to ensure that the ideal cipher K remains unevaluated until the adversary opens uh, the respective cipher text. So as soon as this happens, we can, we can, we being the simulator, we learn the message, can run make, embed the permutation, and then we should be fine. So we just have to guarantee that until open, the adversary will not query any entry in IC in the ideal permutation K. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, intuitively, CCA security of the CAM will ensure that if the adversary sees the encapsulation of K, K prime, cannot obtain K or K prime from it. So he shouldn't be able to query the ideal cipher on key K. And then we got the DEM. And another way for the adversary to force an evaluation would be to submit decryption queries that use as first ent entry the encapsulation of KK prime and some other component. And assuming we would process such a query to, uh, by decryption, we might evaluate the ideal cipher on K, on, on the permutation K. Uh, however, the one-time integrity of cipher texts will ensure that we can just uh, return bot if such a decryption query is happening. And this is why we need the simulatability plus the CCI security of the CAM and the one-time integrity of cipher text by the DEM, which is, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so what did we see? So we defined a structural property of the simulatability of, of DEMs, which we call simulatability. And what does it allow us? Well, simulatability seems to lift uh, the security of hybrid encryption schemes from standard CCA security to simulation-based selective opening CCA security. 
um, somewhat without additional assumptions, so we have to use the simulatability as another assumption. But CCA security plus the one-time security of the Earth. The CCA security of the CAM plus the one-time integrity of the DEM have to be assumed to construct CCA security. And on top of that, we need simulatability of the DEM to get to selective opening CCA security. However, for lots of practical DEMs, uh, simulatability is given. So what does it mean? For lots of really practical public key encryption schemes obtained by the hybrid chem dem paradigm, we actually get simulation by selective opening CCA security for free in the ideal cipher model. Thanks for your attention. You can find the paper on ePrint. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And greetings to Bochum. Thank you very much. Do you have comments or questions? Can you provide some intuition why this isn't implied by standard, um, uh, sorry, semantic security, even for the CPA case? Well, usually your encryption is committing. And once it is committing, it's impossible to output a ciphertext. So I just need a while to get back. Yeah. So what we have to have here is that we want to output ciphertexts without knowing the underlying message. And only later on we learn the message and somewhat have to fix it. And as soon as the ciphertext is committing, there's no way to uh, find randomness such that, OK, maybe for the one-time pad, but for practical uh, data encapsulation mechanisms, it's highly unlikely that you will be able for, uh, to open a ciphertext for any message. Any other comments or questions? Oh. Well, yeah, the assumption are the kind of random model, or either cipher random model uh, is the model, and then as a minimal assumption is that you need to have trapdoor uh, uh, trapdoor function, right? Because the 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 the, in the public key encryption scheme or the key, the CAM, it's uh, in it. it it doesn't have to have any simulability. Correct. Yeah. So, so uh, yeah, that's the thing. I, I, I don't know a lot about uh, simulation, uh, selective opening, but what are the minimal assumption for selective opening? Can you do it uh, from trapdoor function, or do you need like a, a lossy? Uh, if you're, so the thing is that actually, if you're going to go want to go for a standard model results, um, and if you just want to go for, let's say, selective opening CPA security, you need tools like lossy encryption, meaning you need lossy trapdoor functions to construct them. An alternative would be to go for schemes that encrypt bitwise. But in practice, you don't want to consider them. So what do you mean? Uh, bitwise, you mean that? Uh, well, the thing is, if you encrypt bitwise, you might have a chance to find randomness such that a message combined with this randomness becomes an encryption of a ciphertext you already committed to. Just because your message space is really small. Mm -hmm. so, so the, there is no impossibility result, let's say, uh, uh, well, um, from trapdoor function, I can not. Some kind of, if, if there's a notion of committing public encryption, as soon as you go for that, it can't be simulation based, selective opening secure. Any other comments or questions? Quick one. I just have one quick comment uh, or question. D does your technique extend to the receiver selective opening results, security results? Possibly. Oh, possibly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Let's thank the speaker again.
The last talk of this session is selective opening security in the presence of randomness failures. The authors are Bit Tung Huang, Jonathan Katz, Adam O'Neill, and Mohammad Zaheri. And Adam will give a talk. Okay. All right. Uh, hey. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, selective opening security in the presence of randomness failures. Um, I guess.